Bonjour tout le monde, hello everyone, and welcome to the Why Learn French seminar. We're so happy to have you here today to learn about all the awesome opportunities that will come when you learn French. My name is Amy, I'll be your host today. I'll be telling you a little bit about. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. I, like many of you, am a French, uh, past French student. I didn't learn French when I was little, but I started learning French in high school and then continued it throughout all of high school, throughout university. And um, then was able to com continue doing my French throughout my Bachelor of Science. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we live and work. For me, that's the Boon people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people who might be present on the call today. I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that we are all joining this webinar from all parts of the country and from Aboriginal land all around the country. We have schools from Victoria, New South Wales, ACT, Queensland, Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia. Welcome everyone. Uh, some of you may be in lockdown, some of you may be at school. Um, you could be anywhere between year seven or year 12, but one thing that we all have in common is that we all speak French. So uh, the way that this seminar is going to work is we're going to have some video testimonies from past students and professionals who have been working uh, and learning French and using it in their everyday life. And we're also going to be talking to four great panellists who are going to be telling us about all the really great opportunities that are available in all sorts of various different fields. So the goal for this seminar is to answer the question, why learn French? And to get you super excited about learning French and all the opportunities that you'll have um, in the years to come. Now, we have a lot of schools from around the country joining us today. So... It is possible that you have uh, an internet connection issue or something drops out. If that does happen, you can jump onto the FATFA website or you can, uh, where you'll be able to see all of the videos that we'll be putting on today. And I believe we are also live on YouTube on La France en Australie YouTube uh, channel. So without any further ado, why don't we get started with the very first video? which is on a theme that is very important. It's a theme that a lot of people, um, a lot of the people that we talked to brought up and the theme was don't give up. I'm not good at learning languages. It's something that I've heard many times. No one is either good or not good. There was once uh, when English was a foreign language to you and yet you learned to speak it fluently. That's because humans have an inbuilt language function that works uh, with other languages and you can just learn pretty much any number of foreign languages all at once. I, uh, I met a lot of hardships when learning the language. It was, uh, it was quite challenging uh, throughout the, the three years uh, since I started learning it. Uh, initially when I went to university, because I already had a basis, um, I was put in, uh, in quite a higher level. Uh, I believe that uh, at uh, my university it was uh, level 5 uh, that I was uh, starting with. And uh, after a couple of weeks I, I found that I was really struggling. A lot of the other students had spent their whole high school, uh, so year, what, year 7 right up until year 12 uh, studying French before they went to university to, to, um, to the level that I was in. Um, and I, I really struggled. I had a, a decent level of um, conversational French, but I didn't understand uh, well, hardly any grammar, uh, grammar rules, uh, spelling, things like that that you that you learn when you're uh, learning through a structured program. So I had a, a big conversation with my uh, my French uh, lecturer at the time. Uh, she's uh, she's from France, uh, Lyonnais, and. Uh, I said basically I, I, I don't think I can keep up, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop. My French teacher, she's uh, absolutely fantastic and, uh, and she said no look uh, you didn't mark me as one of the students that was struggling, yes you do have to work hard uh, and yes you do have to do a little bit more than other students but you're doing fine, you're going to pass and, uh, and you're going to learn French. With uh, that encouragement I, <laughs> I stuck with the program, uh, I finished off uh, French 5 and 6. Second lesson is don't think that you should aim for native speaking level. People have spoken a foreign language for decades and have lived there, don't lose their accents, nor do they stop making mistakes. They find ways to communicate and they make themselves understood, 
uh, they understand and they contribute to their adopted communities. Nobody expects them to suddenly sound like they were born there. So this principle applies even more so for you because you're learning French in a foreign class, foreign language class here in Melbourne. Don't think for one second that you should achieve native or near native status. You will have an accent, you'll make errors and you will say things that a native speaker wouldn't say, but you will be using the language. And that goes for your writing too, by the way. Your errors are not a sign that you can't use the language properly. They're a sign that you are learning. And I'm sure that you're that in your primary school as well, perhaps since you arrived in high school, that growth mindset, uh, that you've heard that growth mindset is better than the fixed one. That means accepting that you will be making errors and that these errors are good for your learning overall. Um, I remember the fear and intimidation that I faced as a affronted by this beautiful language called French. Um, I have one great example. I, I remember going to a supermarket one day in the in the early days and I was always sort of adding up the, everything that I bought, you know, the, the French wine and baguettes and cheese. I sort of added it up and went, okay, well, I've got enough money for this because I was very fearful of the of the checkout girls. So I sort of walked up and put the bread, cheese and wine down and sort of went to pay and I, I handed over the equivalent of a hundred dollar bill. And the woman just went, what? And started blah, 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 at me. And I'm like going, no, 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 I have more. I have I have more, no. And she's like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, ah. And I panicked and left the stuff on the on the sort of counter and sort of bolted. And, um, you know, I'm a war cameraman, so I'm, I'm not supposed to face fear like that. But that's sort of what the, the French did to me in the early days. I was never really one of the best in French in my class. And in fact, I was ranked towards the bottom of my class in years 11 and 12. I remember crying after a speaking exam in which I didn't really perform very well and calling my friend afterwards and telling her I wanted to drop French altogether because I didn't see any point in continuing to learn French if I wasn't really going to go anywhere with it. But I continued on with French mainly because of my genuine interest in the language, um, my, my genuine interest in French and free different culture and at the end of the day I really wanted to improve my language skills. I really wanted to be able to you know, talk to French speaking people from around the world and it's the main reason why I decided to continue on with French even now until university and I'm really grateful that I didn't give up back then in high school. I appreciate that life beyond school probably feels a long way away at the moment but I can assure you that languages is the one subject that will give you the richest experiences post school. Stick with it. Really great advice there from the end, from Ben at the end there. Stick with it. So now to tell us a little bit more about, to talk a little bit more about that motivation idea as someone who you'll recognize because he just appeared in one of his videos. He is a French teacher and a PhD candidate doing a PhD in applied linguistics, Olivier Elbert. Olivier, bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this. Thank you so much for joining. So you um, have talk to a lot of French students um, during their journey as learning French. Could you please describe to us the typical French students and their typical insecurities, uncertainties, and some difficulties they may have when learning the language? Okay. Well, um, I would say that uh, speaking is probably the most typical insecurity that I see among students. Um, because speaking is very confronting. I mean, we heard some of the, uh, some of the presenters here in the video talk about this. Um, in, in the classes, you have to raise your voice and be heard by everyone, speak a language that you don't feel that you command very well. And in schools, I mean, there's usually been a, a focus on getting the answers right, which means the students end up thinking uh, that if they make errors, either in speaking or in writing the language, that they're not good at it. But actually, um, just to tell you a little story, my, my mother is, a, is an English lady from London. Um, she lived in uh, French speaking Switzerland for many years and uh, she never learned languages formally, uh, only through travels. If I was to assess her French to the same standard that I'm actually assessing the, uh, the students in classroom, my mother would be considered a, a weak student because she has no grammar. But however, she speaks French in all situations of life. Now, I've always actually believed that understanding and speaking should be a number one priority in classes. 
Uh, I think something that you should know is before you come to class, you need to actually be prepared that you will need to engage with the language. I mean, this will help you not freeze. You know, you, you probably have experienced this before when either you hear your teacher speak French or when they ask you to answer a question in, in the language. Uh, it was, it's also going to be a lot less stressful when you come up against something that you don't understand or can't say. And just about speaking, um, I've also noticed that a lot of my students are using a lot of their answers in French with expression English like, uh, or let me think, or yeah, okay, or oh, I know that one, you know, that sort of, uh, sort of did added uh, information. But well, it's not a crime to do so, but I would actually encourage you not to use them because they're more distracting than anything else. And about that, the reason I'm talking about English here is that English can actually be really helpful in, uh, in promoting your own French. If you come up with a sentence that, where there's a bit that you don't know in French, put the English word in it, it's okay. Now your teacher's going to actually correct you or they're going to, uh, to remind you that, you know, or ask you to remember the, the French word, but, uh, that's their job, of course, and that's a good thing. Um, the effort of remembering what, uh, what an expression or word is in French, even if you don't recall it at the end, the effort of remembering actually will help you remember it next time. So uh, just keep practicing, keep trying to remember, and keep practicing your vocab. Yeah, and that's also another good point is sometimes it's helpful to just say the word in English with a French accent, and nine out of ten times you actually do get it right. <laughs> Very true. Um, so you, your thesis is on motivation and overcoming difficulties in studying. Could you give us some examples of struggles and successes that students you know have experienced and how they move forward and maybe some tips that the students watching today could take bring forward from today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first thing that you need to understand about motivation is motivation is many things. Uh, you can be motivated because you're enjoying the class. Uh, because you feel that you're good at learning French, because you're loving the language or the culture, because you want to travel in the future. And it's uh, in our context, you can definitely mean as well that you want to get these bonus points at the end of high school towards your university entrance. All of these motivations are completely valid. There's no uh, you know, moral superiority to one compared to the other. So anything is good to motivate you. I'm just going to take two examples of, uh, of kids that I spoke to during my research. One of them is a girl called Evie. Uh, I mean, that's not her real name, of course, but in, uh, in, her, in her interviews, she told me that when she was five years old, she drew a picture of herself sipping coffee at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. Evie experienced actually quite a lot of challenges in terms of her learning French in high school, but she never let go of this image of her really going to France and visiting places and experiencing the life. And that sort of vision, that imagination of herself going over there and really wanting to experience this life, uh, it really did help her throughout uh, her studies in French. Um, and she ended up uh, you know, with, with a decent score. She wasn't an absolutely brilliant student, but she kept on going and going and going. And as far as I know, in, first, in her first year of university uh, now, she's still uh, studying the language. Um, another one, another example. Can I interrupt quickly? Oh, sorry, yes. Did she, did she end up having that cup, that cup of coffee under the Eiffel Tower? Oh, yes, she did. She went to France uh, as an exchange student, and she, she certainly sipped coffee with her, oh. with her host sisters. So <laughs> Absolutely. Positive visualization is a great motivation then. Certainly. Um, the, the other example I wanted to, uh, to talk about is possibly something that uh, at, at least I see more commonly in my French classes. Um, this boy, so I called him Jack in my, in my PhD. Um, he wasn't bilingual. Uh, he didn't enjoy learning classes in primary school. And he saw himself not really as a language student, but he saw himself actually as a, as a scientist in the future. So, but when he started learning, uh, learning French in high school, he realized actually that he was quite good at it. And that feeling of being good at something is perhaps the most motivating thing that you can find in, uh, in engaging with the language on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, this and the most common experience of students is that the feeling of being good in languages sort of reduces as the level of difficulty goes up. That's pretty, uh, pretty common. And that happened to Jack. And he said to me in an interview that by the time he got to year, year, year nine, he used the expression, I couldn't be bothered, to be honest. But things changed. He had a teacher then who started to show him 
what he was good at and what he could work on. So having this sort of, you know, objective view on what he was doing in French sort of helped him. And he started to be able to see himself as being a success, successful student in continuing to learn French. So uh, there's really two points to here that I wanted to draw from Evie and from Jack. One is that your personal interest is huge in motivating you to continue through challenges. And the other one is being able to focus on what it is that you're good at. Um, everyone finds language learning challenges. There's, there's no question. But we are all able to do it. And there are certain areas, pockets of the language that we are actually really good at. And we, we need to actually focus on those to keep ourselves motivated and to keep going. And I think that uh, in the end, when you get to the end of uh, your year 12 and you've done all this program, there's such a sense of achievement. You should be, you know, that, that, that it's never going to leave you. You know that yeah, you've definitely. done it. Mm, absolutely. That's right, pretty much you. all I wanted to say about, uh, about these two questions. But uh, Thank yeah. you so much, Olivier. And I hope that's helped out a lot of people with, in terms of motivation. So we're going to move on to the next uh, thematic video, which is about personal opportunity. So the first big opportunity that studying French gave me was the chance to study overseas. I went on an exchange program to McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I had never been overseas before, so if it wasn't for French, you know, that first trip may not have ever happened. And that trip set off the travel bug for me. And then another opportunity that I've had was going, being able to go to New Caledonia over the summer as well. Now, I never really knew that there were French-speaking tropical islands, but, you know, I couldn't believe that I had the chance to essentially go and learn French for half the day and spend the rest of it chilling on the beach. It was pretty, pretty unreal. And while I was there, I actually ended up going on New Caledonian television and winning a game show, which was pretty strange, in, in French, of course. Hey, nos amis les Australiens qui ont gagné ce soir, <laughs> le jeu casse pas la tête. Ça va l'équipe orange? Ça va. Oui, c'est bon. So, somehow managed to stumble into another really great opportunity that I'm sure I'll never forget. French has led to some really great opportunities for me, not just um, with the friends that I've met through my course and that I've that have become great friends, but also for the um, the chance to travel a little bit. And I remember um, probably one of my fondest moments is being able to study in Paris for a couple months at the Sorbonne, um, doing a language intensive course. And during that time, I was uh, living in these little hole in the wall Parisian studios. Uh, getting my fresh baguettes every morning um, and I, I remember going down to the Seine River and browsing through the bookshops and uh, really starting to explore more of uh, French culture in a very dir direct way. So uh, that was probably one of the biggest highlights for me um, and then also quite beneficial for uh, practicing the language. But from an opportunist perspective I think it's pretty clear uh, from my sort of story how, how useful languages can be uh, both in your professional development so it's obviously getting jobs and, and moving up um, but then also your personal experiences that you can have so, so as a 21 year old having lived in, in London, Paris and, and Melbourne it's a pretty, it's pretty cool thing to, to go through and even despite the, the coronavirus pandemic and, and none of this would have been possible without my languages so I'd probably still be in Melbourne living with my parents. <laughs> Learning at university as well was really great because I find a lot of people struggle to develop a really wide sort of social net at university and if you take a language class like something like French you instantly have at least 25 people that you're talking with constantly. Sometimes I was studying sociology a lot of classes can tend to be either dead silent or just arguments whereas with French class it was a lot of camaraderie straight away you're constantly talking about um, yourself you're talking about your interests your likes dislikes and just chatting basically. I think French has let me travel to a few different places. I did exchange in France in the Alps, which was a fantastic experience. And then I also went and spent a month in Benin in West Africa, which is a fascinating place. It's actually the home of voodoo. So I visited a Python temple. I stayed with a local family and traveled around. On a personal note, it's like open up an Alibaba cave of treasures of culture and um, stories and 
cooking and being able to personally interact with people who have great stories. And most amazing experience that I've had has been going on exchange to Paris in my third year at university. It was an amazing experience to be able to live there and um, be a local, but also be a tourist at the same time. And it was such an amazing um, learning experience as well because it was it was difficult, and I was really like scared about being in the same classroom as French-speaking people, French students. But it also gave me a really big confidence boost. We took a, an exchange uh, program to France here in Montpellier, and I, I studied at a French university for six months uh, before finding work here uh, in the city. Um, since then, I, uh, I went back to Australia. I've uh, now come back to, to France on a permanent basis, uh, where I, I look to uh, live out uh, the rest of my uh, rest of my years, we'll say. I volunteered with the French Red Cross in Caritas, where I met so many lovely and interesting people. I was invited to colleagues' houses for dinner parties, on camping trips, and could also go along to the cinema without needing to choose the films with subtitles. Living in a French-speaking island was a dream come true. I'm so lucky to have been able to have had such an experience thanks to the fact that I chose to continue with French at high school and beyond. Before I bring up our next panelist, just to remind you that we've got a little Q&A down the bottom. So if you have any questions at any time, please let us know and we'll visit, revisit those questions later at the end of the webinar. Now, to tell us a little bit more about the opportunities that can come to you when you speak French um, in a, from a university point of view, we have Carolyn Stott. She is a senior lecturer in French and Francophone studies at the University of Sydney. Carolyn, bonjour. Bonjour, Aimé. So we saw in the video, lots of these students had um, exchange experiences and a lot of them had scholarships or grants from the university or from the government. So universities and governments invest a lot of money in supporting students to go on exchanges. Why do they do this? Why is it so important for them to invest in these sorts of programs? Yeah, great question. Well, I mean, firstly, we live in a multicultural world um, and in Australia, we're actually relatively isolated and we also have a monoling monolingual English uh, culture. So we really need to prepare our students at university to become global citizens to participate in a global culture and to make global connections. Um, another reason why it's important for um, the uni to send students away on exchange is so that for their own personal um, growth, they can um, achieve uh, the near native fluency that they wouldn't be able to achieve um, unless they spent time in a, in a French speaking country. Um, from a personal perspective, Empathy and tolerance are two um, skills that um, students gain or um, improve upon um, whilst they're on exchange. Um, tolerance for um, international an international student community when they come back, perhaps, um, and, it, and an acceptance and an understanding of different cultural perspectives. And finally, I think really just um, uh, going on exchange, um, living without living um, uh, away from home. Um, being in, a, in an unknown environment really does help you to become the best person that you can be in terms of personal growth. Yeah, definitely. And I know that from my own experience because I was on exchange last year during the coronavirus pandemic and I got stranded overseas, but I still think it was a great experience. And especially what you say about empathy is, you know, that idea of you suddenly know what it's like to be in a country where no one else speaks your language and you're the minority. And when you go back home, you can have a much greater understanding of other people. Um, so, so that all the students listening have an idea, could you tell us what the typical French student would do during an exchange program? Sure. So, of course, um, attending the classes, that's why you're there. Um, and the more you prepare um, in terms of the, um, the, the, the work that's um, been set, for example, and the, the post-tutorial um, and lecture work, the, the more um, uh, progress you're going to make in, in terms of your French. Um, Mixing with others and making friends is really important um, and soaking up the culture as well. Um, 
there's a lot of time to do that. And students often find as well that um, they have time to travel during the quite long uni breaks um, to other parts of the country in which they find themselves or to other countries. For example, um, if they're in, uh, in France, um, there are lots of um, other countries on their doorsteps. Um, of course, they also need to learn to cope with those ups and downs that are part of every um, exchange experience. I mean, it's not all great. There will certainly be moments of homesickness um, and moments of self-doubt, self but I also think that these um, opportunities will um, help them um, to, I mean, the, the, the opportunities will be in their minds for, forever and the things that they've learned and the friends that they've made. And have you ever met a student who's regretted their exchange experience? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolyn. Now, um, we appreciate that everyone who's listening right now is either at the end of a very long week, uh, the end of a long week at school or at the end of a long week of remote learning. So we're going to have a tiny little break. Um, and I um, would like you to just kind of like get up, move around a little bit. You know, it's Friday afternoon. And now we'd like you to have a go with this violong, which is a French, the French word for a tongue twister. So it's quite simple, but you'll see how hard it is soon. So say it with me if you're at school or if you're at home. It's sac, chien, chasse, chat, which sounds super simple. Five dogs chase six cats, cinq chien, chasse, si, cha. But try saying it again, cinq chien, chasse, si, cha, and then try saying it faster and faster and see how many times you can say it in the next 30 seconds and how, how quickly you can say it. Cinq chien, chasse, si, cha, chasse, cinq chien, si, cha. And as you're doing that at home or at school, I hope that our panellists are giving it a go too, because in a few seconds, I'm going to call on one of them to see how quickly they can do it. So, cinq chien, chasse, cha, cinq chien, chasse, cha, cinq chien, chasse, cha. Okay, I might pick on a panellist to bring up. How about Olivier? Would you please turn your camera on and have a go at this violon? Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> uh, so, uh, cinq chiens, chasse, six chats. I'm cheating a little bit because I'm going very slowly. But if yes. I go, it's going fast. Cinq chiens, chasse, six chats. <laughs> pretty much the best I can do. <laughs> very good. Thank you so much. And everyone, you can look up Violong. Uh, there are so many on the internet and it'll be really helpful for your pronunciation and for your vocab um, and teachers it's probably a great uh, little exercise to do for when you're running out of things to do maybe on Friday afternoons to get uh, the students to do that. Okay so moving on the next video we're going to watch so that was great that Carolyn and I were talking about all the different countries you can visit because um, you know if you go on exchange in France you can visit all of the neighboring countries around it um, and that links us really nicely to our next video, whose theme is French as a global language. So let's go and have a look at that one. French is the only language other than English that's spoken on all continents. Our closest neighbors be, one of our closest neighbors be French, New Caledonia. There are more French speakers in Africa than in Europe. I have a couple of friends, for example, that secured dream jobs in French speaking regions in Canada, other areas of Europe that wouldn't have been possible if they didn't speak at least some French. I have another friend who got a job as part of a cruise company going to Vanuatu in New Caledonia. Again, only possible because they were bilingual and able to speak French. I began learning French because I really love traveling. And when I travel, I was annoyed, I was frustrated that I could only speak English and that therefore I was relying on the host country to speak to me in what may not have been their first language. So I've been learning French, most continents speak French, it's an incredibly common language. Uh, and if you can speak French to people that natively speak French, your travel experience is going to be so much, so much deeper. It's going to be so much more enriched. I spent three years living and working in New Caledonia, a collectivity of France in the Pacific Ocean, not too far from Fiji and Vanuatu. My most recent time living on the island was actually last year. I've met so many amazing people um, along the way. From the other language assistants to fantastic teams of English teachers, um, to university students completing Erasmus exchanges. I now have friends in Spain, Hungary, Luxembourg, Germany, 
Japan, Reunion Island, Guadeloupe, Cameroon, Senegal. Um, and of course, I still have my local New Caledonian friends. I'm not sure if everyone knows, but in the world there is 43 French speaking countries. And a lot of those countries are in Africa from the colonial times. I've worked in many of those countries in Africa, in particular West Africa and Morocco. And it's uh, definitely a communication language. Montreal is a bilingual French English city in the officially French province of Quebec. So it was a really amazing opportunity to leave Australia for the first time and get into a culture that was so unique. It's very different to English Canadian culture, very different to French from France culture. That was a very impressive list of <laughs> countries there. Yeah. Um, we are now going to talk to uh, someone who is going to tell us a little bit more about Australia in all sorts of, uh, sorry, about speaking French in different countries, in particular in Australia. So Gregory Delanoy is a manager in systems and software at the FACHI, which is the French and Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which groups together all of the French businesses that are working in Australia. Gregory, bonjour. Bonjour. Can you see me and hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, perfect. I, I, I have lots of video on your side, but that's good if you can see me. Okay, um, so you can hear me okay? Sorry? You can no. hear me okay? I, I can hear you fine. That, that's Great. okay. Okay. So, yeah, welcome. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to emphasize first um, the strong economic relationship between France and Australia. Uh, there are more than uh, 600 French companies operating in Australia at the moment and they employ uh, 70,000 people in Australia. 70,000, wow. Yeah, it's also working the other way around. Uh, there are 140 Australian companies operating in France uh, at the moment. So it shows that there is a lot of exchange between the two countries. Just to give you an idea of the volume we are talking about, uh, in 2019-2020, the volume of exchange between France and Australia was around 10.6 billion. Uh, with a ratio of three to one for France. So basically France was exporting three times more than importing from Australia. But it's still quite an impressive figure in terms of exchange between the, the two countries. Yeah, definitely. And so uh, we saw that uh, French can open us up to the world. We saw all those other countries, but what role does French play in the international business sphere? And what kind of opportunities can it give to French speakers in Australia? Uh, as the video alluded to, French is spoken in a lot of countries, in a lot of continents, and uh, French has a general geopolitical influence. It's true in Africa, and if we go closer to Australia, it's very true in the South Pacific region. So France has obviously presence in uh, New Caledonia, in French Polynesia, and uh, for any Australian company trading in the South Pacific, uh, having the advantage of knowing the, the French culture or knowing the French language is definitely a plus in your business relationship with France. Uh, it's also translates into more, I would say, geopolitical influence. Uh, a number of military contracts have been recently signed between France and Australia, in particular for the for the submarines. And it's also linked to the fact of that geo geopolitical influence of France around the world and the general partnerships on the within between the two countries. So that's really a sign, a, a telltale sign of the partnership, level of partnership that France can have with international partners. Now, if I go to the second part of your question, what's the advantage of uh, speaking French on, or learning French for an Australian student nowadays uh, in an economic context? Again, there are many opportunities. Uh, the first one that, uh, that I would mention in terms of opportunities is that we hear all, all the time that English is a business language, is a preferred language of business. That's true, definitely true. However, it's so much easier when you can have informal meetings uh, with your colleagues in a French uh, company or talking to, uh, to French counterparts uh, directly in French, because it creates that sense of exchange on trust between the parties. Uh, and even if your French is not fluent, but the fact that you've learned French and you can have a few sentences in French and you can have a, a basic conversation, uh, it's really helping to build that trust between, uh, between the, the people. So that, that's really great for that. It doesn't mean that most of the 
major meetings will still be conducted in English, but having this ability to have these informal discussions, clarification sometimes in French can be a, can be really good. The second advantage is, and uh, all the previous uh, panelists uh, mentioned that you don't only learn a language, you learn a culture. And uh, business relationships work a lot on understanding of each other. And when you learn French, you will learn about French culture and you will understand how French approach work, which is different sometimes for Anglo-Saxon and Australian. And it's good to see the cultural differences. A approach to meetings, you, uh, I remember the first time I, uh, I started in Australia, uh, I learned that I have to conduct meetings in a very different way. French are sometimes very direct in the way they approach meetings, very factual. And sometimes uh, when you conduct meetings in Australia, you have to find that right balance uh, and not be so direct, but properly introduce the subjects. And, and it's a very different approach to conduct meetings. And you need, when you have learned the language, when you have learned about the culture, you know how to to behave differently depending on the cultural context. And it's very important if you work with French counterparts uh, to understand also how their culture works. So that's definitely an advantage. The last one, and uh, I will emphasize again the number of partnerships going between France and Australia, is that a lot of the companies which are interfacing and a lot of French companies working uh, internationally, uh, high tech companies or defense companies. And these companies, when they operate in another country, they need to do very strong uh, knowledge transfer. And when you choose a candidate for a knowledge transfer, this is a key candidate. That's the person that you will train, you will invest a lot in them. So you want to be sure that if you send them to France for a period of time uh, and to bring them back to Australia, you want to be sure that they will adapt in a French culture. So you tend to prefer students who are or colleagues who have worked in your company, but also who have a certain level of command of, of the French language or knowledge of the French culture, because definitely you think that they will be more likely to adapt in the country. And that's why if you consider a career, um, an international career uh, involving working with French, basically having the command of the French language is definitely an advantage because it will give you the edge to be chosen for this type of assignment. And uh, yeah, just a small correction. Uh, yeah, I've been working uh, at Airbus, so in France, I'm now in Australia, and um, I'm supporting also the French Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And basically, even when you look at Airbus, when we send people overseas, uh, we choose candidates based on their skills and, and also their ability to adapt in an international context. That's all I had to, to say. Thank today. you so much, Gregory. And that's a great link as well. That idea that speaking in French gives you that leg up in a career perspective and for a job opportunity. And a uh, great link to our next uh, theme because the next video we are going to watch is about job opportunities. So let's give that a watch. Learning a language and becoming bilingual shows to a prospective employer that you've got qualities such as perseverance, the tolerance of other people and other cultures, and that you're quite creative. From a job perspective, the world's getting smaller. More than half the population is bilingual, and as Australians, we're no longer competing against just each other. I work each time as an English language assistant in Umea, the capital of New Caledonia. I was able to secure this job as applicants needed to prove their level of spoken French was at a B1, B2 or intermediate level. I had a phone interview with the French consulate in Canberra, uh, which was partially in French, and voila, got the job. Uh, you know, uh, you have a client, uh, you hear the French accent, and you can ask, uh, uh, do you prefer to speak French? And then you switch over into a language and you instantly feel them open up and, and feel a lot more comfortable. If I hadn't lived in Montreal, I wouldn't have visited New York City, and now I live in New York City. <laughs> uh, so in my job as a speech language pathologist, I work with students who have a hard time understanding understanding language or expressing themselves and this is something I can really relate to having learned French. Another thing that I've been able to do thanks to French is I'm working as a journalist so it's meant that I've been able to interview people in French uh, which has been a big bonus for my career but also really really fun. The other great opportunity that French has given me is with the military. I recently applied to the Australian Defence Force and they do a lot of humanitarian projects in the Pacific, which I really wanted to get into. As my recruitment officer was looking at my resume, he said, oh, you speak French. 
I said yes, and he said, oh, we can use you in an intelligence position if we make you an officer. And so now we're going with that. Um, they're sending me to the Royal Military College in Canberra. And when I graduate from that, I'm going to be a lieutenant straight away instead of just a, a regular soldier who graduates and is a private. When Fr French Polynesia was in the midst of a concerning outbreak um, in the second half of last year, an outbreak of COVID-19, that work was done in close collaboration with um, the epidemiological and clinical teams on the ground in French Polynesia. And so my, um, my French language skills, which um, I, I hadn't really used professionally before, suddenly became very useful for the situation. I realised that that languages were super useful uh, from an academic development point of view and, and I think those helped me get into sort of my dream course. So I, I did a Bachelor of Commerce at the University of Melbourne um, with, with uh, bread subjects in French and the amount of opportunities that afforded me were, were amazing so I, I ended up in my second year um, which I would have been about 19 I think uh, picking up an internship in, in Paris uh, for a French asset manager and servicing French clients. So obviously French was was a huge part of the role and it, it really drove my development. From an ANZ UK perspective, one story that really resonates with me is the time we were helping a history teacher secure a new position. He was going up against two other teachers who were very similar in experience and he was ultimately successful. We found out later that the reason the school preferred him over the other two teachers was the fact that he could speak French and they ran an annual French trip that he might be able to help out with. When I was working my that he might be able to help out with. When I was working Mali, I was really one of the very few expats there that spoke French. None of the others really spoke French. Uh, the government there only spoke French and a previous project I was working on in Mali, the technical de documentation was in French and Russian, so good to know French. When I was working for Alcoa, I took um, biennial trips to the Sangarini project in Guinea, and that's a French speaking project. Everything is French, all the documentation was in French, so I, um, I was recruited to that particular project because I needed somebody who could speak and understand French so they didn't have to do everything in two languages. Being able to go to another country and drop straight into a into the language and be at ease makes my life so much easier, whether it be in Rwanda or Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal or Montreal. You know, so it's actually helped me and I, I get jobs because of my, my language skills, albeit they're, they're not, you know, 100%. I've gained a new understanding and appreciation of the benefits of being bilingual and the doors that it can open both in a job sense and the cultural experiences that you can gain from it. I believe that last video may have answered one of the questions that I saw in the Q&A, which was about how many um, or which African countries speak French. We saw a lot of people had visited a whole lot of African countries, French speaking countries in Africa. So now to tell us a little bit more about these job opportunities, we have Clément Nombu. He's a French teacher at the Defence Force School of Languages. Clément, bonjour. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. So uh, you teach French at the Defence Force and we just saw Andreas telling us that his position in the army will be fast-tracked due to his French language proficiency. So why is it that Andreas would be given more opportunities due to his language skills? Yes, um, so um, Andreas' example is it's a great example of how, you know, this very little line on your resume can change everything. Um, and who would have thought really that um, uh, the Australian Defence Force uh, was really looking for uh, language skills. Um, I have to say that having language skills is definitely a great asset in the, in the ADF, the Australian Defence Force. Uh, there are many opportunities for ADF members to use foreign languages in and out uh, field operations or exercises. Uh, just as for French, I can mention numerous uh, military exercises run by France and Australia, where Australian and defense, uh, Australian and French uh, defense forces are involved. Um, just an example, the exercise uh, Southern Cross, 
is the largest ever humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercise in the South Pacific area. So it's, it's really, really uh, important for the ADF uh, to have uh, linguists. And um, uh, we can as well talk about um, um, a lot of uh, different postings where um, only members with French language skills uh, can access. Um, obviously, we've got uh, the Australian Embassy in Paris that uh, needs uh, proficient uh, speakers. Uh, we've got uh, postings at the War College as well for um, junior officers. Uh, there is also, also the NATO headquarter in Brussels, as you know, is a uh, French uh, speaking uh, part of uh, Belgium. And um, I can mention as well, there are positions that are part of the cooperation between uh, different government agencies, uh, such as DFAT, for example, uh, the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs. Um, in, in a few words, just being proficient in a foreign language uh, shows, uh, first of all, good uh, cognitive abilities, uh, great communication skills, uh, a certain capacity to, to adapt, capacity to communicate in a cross-cultural environment, and, uh, and as well the ability of uh, problem-solving skills in a uh, cross-cultural environment. Um, in the ADF, uh, we constantly train new linguists. Uh, for example, I work at the, the different uh, four school of languages um, here in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and um, we provide constantly uh, intensive learning, uh, language learning trainings. Yeah, and all of those skills that you said that come, uh, come with learning a language sound like really important skills that the army would want in people that, um, that are working for them. So, and yeah, considering that you do teach French to people who are in the army. It's obviously a great leg up and a great opportunity if you've already got those French skills. And I know that when I started learning French, I never would have thought um, of the army as an option. I'm sure Andreas thought the same, but it's great that they, it opens up so many opportunities. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Clément. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, no, well, um, for Andreas, it was about uh, intelligent services, so mm -hmm. which is a very important part of nowadays. Uh, um, international relations in general. There are more and more missions that are, you know, about the coordination with foreign armies. Um, the Australian Defence Force as well conducts a lot of uh, uh, humanitarian aid missions uh, where um, we go, and especially here in the South Pacific region, um, other panelists uh, mention uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia. And um, so all those areas of influence for Australia are uh, needing um, French linguists. Uh, yes. And there is a significant growth in uh, defense relations uh, with French speaking uh, counterparts uh, overall. Um, another panelist talked about um, the different contracts in terms of military equipment. And then again, French companies are quite, uh, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but uh, quite present in on the uh, Australian market. And once again, it's, uh, it gives um, people an edge in terms of um, uh, business there, but uh, just in terms of um, uh, relations uh, with um, civilian uh, institutions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to our final uh, video, which is where we asked every we asked everyone who uh, did a video for us to give us the advice that they would give to their younger self. So, everyone, um, I think this will be very helpful. I'll admit that I'm one of those students that didn't continue with languages past year nine and it's one of the biggest regrets I've got. What I would say to my younger self is a bit cliche, but I think still very much relevant, and that's just take every opportunity you can um, and say yes to as much as you can, because particularly when learning a language, you'll always reap the benefits from it. 
um, and I never would have thought I'd be doing a, a PhD in French when I started university and I couldn't be gladder. My advice to my younger self would be, it's okay, it's alright to make mistakes, this is a process. I think that's what I didn't really understand when I was studying French. Um, it wasn't until my teachers knew that and they, they knew exactly where we were along the process, but I didn't know that. My advice to my younger self uh, would be definitely, especially from, from prep to year 10, to have taken my languages, especially French, more seriously. Um, because ever since I decided to really get serious about it, I've just been playing catch up. Um, because I, I'd let my, my level go, go to such a poor level that, that, um, that I always need just to, to sort of relearn things and, and, and put in more effort where I wouldn't usually have had to put in effort and, and still am today. So, so I think if I just put in a bit more effort earlier on and actually learn to love the language and then learn to, to enjoy the learning experience, I, I think I, I definitely have saved myself a lot of time and a lot of annoyance and, and, and be definitely at a level today that it would be much better. My advice to my younger self would have been to um, to focus on my conversational French skills um, and to seek opportunities to speak to other people in French because my uh, my reading and writing skills have always been much stronger than um, my speaking skills but I found that um, traveling and even this most recent experience um, professionally that um, the conversational skills would have um, have definitely been the most useful. I think I'd tell myself don't ignore the basics. They can be boring, but the sooner you get on top of them, the easier it makes everything else. So, you know, I sort of bombarded myself with it um, rather than taking it slow and disciplined. And I, I think that's a word that I'm going to use quite often in this little talk is discipline because that's what I believe helps everything along. I think looking back, um, some advice I'd give would be to you know, not get disheartened when things get really difficult. Learning a new language is a is a challenge, um, and it's something that continues for a really long time. It's not really something where you can say, "Well, I've learnt that now, like I'm done, move on to the next thing." You have to keep going, and it's a continual process, essentially for the rest of your life. Keep your head down, push through the hardships, because at the end of it, it's all worth it. It's absolutely brilliant. thing there being lots of people wish they could go back and tell their years yeah, their year seven up to year 12 selves that keep going and keep doing it and you know you're going to be doing practicing French and improving your French for the rest of your life. So now we have some time to um, respond to some of the questions that you have provided. So there are some you can use the QA or you've also um, put in some questions uh, you submitted some questions uh, upon registration. So I could get all the panelists to jump back on. Um, okay, so I, oh, one question that's come through is, why should I learn French uh, when Google Translate is an option? Who would like to answer that one? Carolyn, have a go if you like. You <laughs> go on, we start with Carolyn and then pass on to Klimmel. Okay, sorry, uh, Klimmel. Um, uh, the simple answer is to give themselves a challenge um, to acquire critical thinking skills, all the, all the skills that will count in terms of um, helping you to get a job. Some of the things Clemmer was talking about before in his presentation, um, those skills um, such as critical thinking skills, which high school students often lack when they uh, enter university. So it's crucial that um, they pick them up. And one of the ways, one of the great ways to do that is through learning a language. Also, um, we learn to understand our own language better when we study uh, another language. Anything to add yeah. to that? Yeah, I, I, um, I'd like to add something. Um, I completely agree with uh, what was just said. Uh, and maybe on the more like technical um, angle. Um, um, uh, so at university, I studied uh, one of my subjects was about uh, digital humanities. And we were, it's what based on um, uh, phonology and uh, phonetics. And we studied um, voice recognition programs, deck to speech uh, programs. And um, we found out very quickly that uh, we're, they are not there yet and they are far from being there yet. So if you rely on Google Translate to uh, really express yourself in a foreign language, 
you may create a lot of misunderstandings. Um, we, you know, uh, a foreign language, speaking a foreign language is very contextual. Uh, so you would have to enter all the contextual factors before you can uh, enter a translation. And um, they cannot pick up proper nouns. Uh, they cannot pick, pick up a lot of things, uh, accents as well. And um, so, um, yeah, no, you'd, you'd rather use your brain to, um, to, to speak a foreign language, believe me. It's not gonna come over the next 50 years, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. Another question I've just seen um, is, how can you improve your French accent? So I can, while the other two or the other four reflect on this, I can give you some tips. Um, one thing that I do is listen. So you're so lucky that you've got the internet available and you can watch so many videos, YouTube videos, interviews, watch shows on Netflix of people, French speakers speaking French. And then if you watch enough or listen to enough podcasts of the same person, you can eventually sort of like imitate them and you understand the way that their intonation works and you can say okay if I was this person how would I say it and the more you hear it the much better it can get um so those are my tips for improving a French accent does anyone else have anything to add to that one um, can Go I say ahead. something uh yes mimicry is a great way to improve your accent <laughs> but um uh, sometimes I feel like students are, can be a bit um, ashamed of their accent and I have to tell you um accents are cute um so um you know do not restrain too much your English accent when speaking French it's not really about the accent at the end of the day it's more about um, the vocabulary and um the grammar you can uh, you can display um so that's it yeah, I, I totally agree with that comment. I, I think uh, people don't care about your accent. As long as you're making the effort to speak their language, I think people really appreciate that. I was mentioning before the, the trust, on how to build trust uh, yeah, on relationships with people in a business context. And even if you have the accent, on, I've never lost my French accent, for example, when I speak English. But the other way around, when you have uh, Australian people talking to French on, on making the effort to speak in French, their French counterparts don't care if their accent is not perfect. They, they really appreciate that the people make the effort to, to mm. speak their language. So don't be bothered with the accent. It's always nice to get it. And I think the more immersion you have, the more movies you see, the, the more people you talk to, it will get better over time. But don't worry about it. It's, it's not a problem. So. I, if I can ask, uh, just add to what Gregory just said, I, I totally agree with him. And I think that... Uh, uh, in terms of the accents, uh, I mean, I, I'm married to an Australian uh, woman that I met in, in France. And, uh, you know, I probably fell in love with her because she was speaking French with an English accent. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I would say do not, uh, do not necessarily think that you need to, to emulate the French accent. It's, I, I, think, I think it's more about pronunciation than about mm -hmm. accent, if I can make that little distinction here. Yeah, and as someone who went through the VCE system, I know that at the end, when you're doing your French oral, it's really nerve-wracking. You think, oh, my accent's no good. But yeah, what everyone else has just said is a really good point that, you know, you can't, at the end of the day, you can't control everything. You can learn to improve your pronunciation. You can learn to improve your grammar skills and your fluency. Um, and you can learn to improve your vocab. I've just seen a question come through. Do French movies help with improving your French vocab? Definitely, they do. Um, but yeah, don't get too hung up on the accent. We just have one minute to go. So I'd like to remind everyone, I'll just let everyone know that we've got a survey that we'd love you to complete, um, which will appear in the chat very soon. And it's going to, it's just a super quick um, survey that we want the students to fill out to tell us how did you find this um, webinar? What did you think? Did you love it? Um, we definitely want to hear if you loved it. Um, also, you know, how do you think we can improve the next time? What would you change? And also for all the teachers, we'll be sending you a great little surprise, which will be on the FATFA website and I believe in your inboxes as well. Uh, which is an escape room that you can uh, complete with your students uh, that you can do next time you have a class. It's a really fun interactive game that we've put together to teach you lots about la francophonie, so about all of the French speaking countries, uh, and to get you excited about all the very many opportunities with French. Um, I think maybe within the 30 or so seconds that we have left, could people maybe answer this question, what advice would you give new language learners? So everyone could just go around with their top tips. Don't be shy, speak up, have a go, make mistakes and learn from them. 
definitely. Make fun of yourself. <laughs> and talk, talk, talk is that the best way to learn. So. Um, I would say don't forget the culture. Uh, I think yes. like, being in love with the culture would, you know, uh, definitely enhance your uh, long term learning. So. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to our four panelists for coming along and giving us such great insight. Thank you to all the teachers and students who joined today. Uh, and we hope that we've helped answer the question, why learn French? Thank you so much. Merci. Au revoir. Merci. Merci.